you would please take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 3, and we'll start from there in just a moment. Romans chapter 3. On January the 26th of 2020, breaking news hit the airwaves that shook Los Angeles like a California earthquake. NBA basketball star Kobe Bryant had died in a helicopter crash along with eight other precious souls, including his 13-year-old daughter Gianna. While Kobe was playing basketball, I so enjoyed watching what he could do. His name tends to come up in any conversation when people talk about the GOAT, the greatest of all time. Five-time NBA champion, 18-time NBA All-Star. He even won an Oscar for a documentary, an animated film entitled Dear Basketball. After Kobe died, I, I, I kind of had begun to take some interest and I began to study and look and I became even more enthralled with how he did what he did. The mindset, the mentality, the work ethic that made it all happen. I stand before you this morning telling you that I love the mindset of great athletes. And evidently God does too. Because in athletics we see the principles that even God himself wants us to bring over into what we do. And it's very easy to do because over and over and over in the Bible there are passages where God points to the athletic mentality over and over again. The Bible talks about exercise. The Bible talks about training. It talks about practice and running and finishing and winning. And ultimately it talks about receiving the crown. I'm going to be using that this morning and it will be very much to my disappointment if anybody goes out and says he preached on Kobe Bryant today. <laughs> you must understand that I'm just taking it as a template to talk about greater things. But yet the principles are definitely there in a sermon that I simply entitled this morning Closing the Gap on Perfection a vision for excellence. My title this morning is based on one statement that Kobe made when he visited the University of Alabama. No, Alabama. <laughs> to talk to the football team. And that makes a point. The principles apply no matter what the craft might be. When they asked Nick Saban about his thoughts about Kobe's visit after Kobe had died, he said this, he said, the one thing that stuck out to me when he came is that he said this, Kobe said, I always knew that perfection was unattainable, but I went to work every day seeking to close the gap on perfect just as much as I possibly could. And I want to tell you, when I heard that, I said, that's it. That's it right there. That's exactly what I am striving to do, not in basketball, but striving to do as a disciple of Jesus Christ. I am seeking to close the gap Amen. as much as I possibly can. I give you about four principles this morning. First of all, our pursuit is the pursuit of perfection. It is the pursuit of being just like Jesus. In Romans, the third chapter in verse 23 that I had you to turn to, the Apostle Paul reminds us that this thing of being perfect, of being exactly like Jesus, is never going to happen by ourselves. Because Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all stumble in many things, James chapter 3 and verse 2 says. So by ourselves, this is never going to happen. But do you realize that the Bible does teach, though, that on the day that Jesus comes, we are going to be made just like 
him. In 1 John chapter 3, the thrilling verses come forth. As John says, beginning in verse 2, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, and we will see him as he is. God is promising that one day, He's going to make every single one of us here that belong to him, he's going to make us all like his original son. We're all going to be made just like Jesus. But that raises the question, what am I supposed to do between now and then? We know that perfection in this life is unattainable, but what do we do? We go to work every day seeking to close the gap between us and Jesus. Bottom line is you give it everything you've got in this life to be as much like Jesus as you can be and his promise is I'll cap off the rest when it's all said and done. In verse 3 he simply says everyone who has this hope, what hope? The hope of one day being like Jesus. Everyone who has this hope does what now? He purifies himself just as he is pure. One day I will be totally pure, but I'm working on my purity now. I'm working to become more and more like Jesus. And I know that there's a vast gap between us and him. But what I'm trying to help you to see is that you can't close the distance. And that's what we're striving to talk about this morning. And that gap can be closed tremendously. Vince Lombardi, one of the greatest coaches of all time, said himself that perfection is not attainable. But if we chase perfection, we can catch excellence. I like that. I will never catch perfection in this life, but I can catch excellence. Somewhere in between, there can be excellence that comes into our lives. Jason Hughes, who is an executive for CEO Hughes Marina, said, When passion and hard work intersect, it's there that you're going to find excellence. We can close the gap, people. And the truth is, you can be so much more than we are that people can come to say, I see Jesus in him. In Luke, the sixth chapter, in verse 40, Jesus said it this way Luke, chapter 6, and verse 40. Jesus said, A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. In Acts the, 14th, uh, Acts the 4th chapter in verse 13, they were trying to figure out how do these apostles do what they do? We threaten them, we put them in prison, we kill some of them. How do they just keep on doing what they're doing so boldly? You can't stop them. They take a lick and keep on ticking. Verse 13 says, When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. We are what we repeatedly do. Therefore, excellence ought to be a habit in our lives as Christians with everything that we do. I think about the Apostle Paul. All of us understand that the Apostle Paul in this life never did attain perfection in this life. But I'll tell you what I think he did catch. I think he called excellence. If I ask the question this morning, among all the Bible characters in the Bible other than Jesus, who would you say probably caught more of the excellence than anyone? I think we would probably say the Apostle Paul. And I think that humbly even he knew it. Even he realized that through Jesus Christ, he had become so much more than he ever imagined. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 10, humbly he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. He seems to understand that Jesus has brought me so far. And he communicates that in a humble kind of way. He had become much, but he understood that it was only by the power of God. But the question is, how did he do it? 
How did the Apostle Paul become so much like Jesus himself? I want to suggest to you that it was his mindset. It's what happened between his ears that made him become what he became. One of the things you find about the Apostle Paul is that he was not going to let anything, he was not going to let anything get in the way of his pursuit of Jesus. I think Philippians 3 is a pump-up chapter. I've loved it for a long time. But he says in Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 7 and 8, Paul says, the things that were gained to me, all of the earthly credentials that I could have had, he said, I counted it all loss for Christ. Indeed, I count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I do count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. All that stuff he could have been in Judaism, a Pharisee, a Hebrew of Hebrews, circumcised the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin. He says, it's nothing to me anymore. I count it all as dung, some versions say. If you don't know what that is, come back home with me and take a walk across my cow pastures. <laughs> he says, that's what all that stuff is to me. He says here, it, it, some versions say rubbish. It's the idea of table scraps. I really like that one because in the previous section, he said, I've got these dogs nipping at my heels everywhere I go. The, the, they're dogs. They're, 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 they're practicing mutilation in their insistence on circumcision. And basically what he says here, if the dogs want all that stuff in uh, Judaism, they can have it. They can have the table scraps. I'm eating from the meal. I count all things lost for Christ. And another thing you see is that he was never satisfied. He's never satisfied with where he is in his growth. I want you to see what he says concerning that in verses 12 through 15. He says, not that I have already attained or am already perfected. He says, I'm not there yet. I'm not perfected yet. But I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press. And that word press is the idea of straining every ligament. I strain every ligament, pressing toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And he sought greatly to pass on that mentality to other Christians. Paul was like basically saying, come on, get with it. Let's grow. Let's be like him. Never be satisfied. He would say in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, Be ye followers of me, as I also am of Jesus Christ. Go for more. Listen to me. Seek to perfect every single facet of your life. This is the mindset. But how do we do it? How do we do it? Principle number two, we go to work every day seeking to close the gap. You have got to want to close the gap with an insatiable hunger. The words of the Apostle Paul was, I labored more than them, than them all. Paul is just saying, I got after it. And you can't help but feel that energy and feel that zeal and feel that enthusiasm when he says that, I labored more than them all. Now, let me ask you something. You know why Kobe was far better than most everybody else? That. That's the template that we bring over into what we do. In fact, I saw one interview with him. Listen carefully. He talks about training. And one thing he said is when I got to the NBA, I was amazed at how little so many of them did. He said, for example, one guy gets up at 10 o'clock. He trains from 12 to 2. Then he recovers. He trains again from 6 to 8. He goes home. He goes to bed. He's gotten in a total of two sessions. Kobe said, but imagine the difference if I get up at 3 o'clock. One thing you find out about him is he didn't need much sleep, evidently. I get up at 3 o'clock. I train from 4 to 6 and recover. I train from 9 to 11 and recover. 
I train from 2 to 4 and then recover. I train from 7 to 9 and recover. Look at how much more training I have done by simply starting at 4 a.m. If you do that, as the years go on, the separation that you have from your peers will grow larger and larger and larger, and by year five or six, it doesn't matter how much work they do, they are never going to catch up. He says there's a compound effect to that, and there's no way they can catch me because they have not labored like I have labored. And that is the spirit, that is the grit and the determination that we have to bring in this as well. We have to have a hunger. Listen, you need to have a hunger that excels what most people are doing. You need to have a hunger that excels what people around you are doing. I appreciate my friend Lowell Salee that pointed out in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24 as Paul is talking about Christianity and he compares it here to the athleticism of a race he says do you not know that those who run in a race all run but one receives the prize and Lowell pointed this out and I appreciated it you and I are running a race and you don't have to beat me I don't have to beat you. You don't have to finish like only one person gets the prize. All you got to do is finish. You finish, you win. But what Paul is saying here is I am saying that Christians must go at this like only one person can get it. And that person's going to be me. You go at it like only one can win. And I am going to win. And so he continues to say, everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. They do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body. And I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Going at it like only one person can get it, and that's going to be you. And now what I want to say to you, and I preach it all the time, it's my sugar stick. You need to set up spiritual workouts for yourself every single day. We won't turn there, but in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7, he says that we are to exercise ourselves unto godliness. Exercise yourself unto godliness. He says bodily exercise profits a little. It does. <laughs> But godliness is profitable for all things because it has the promise of the life that now is and the life which is to come. That word exercise in 1 Timothy 4 is the Greek word gymnazo. I normally don't use Greek words, but I like it when I like it. Gymnazo. What does that look to you? What does that look like? Gymnasium. And so really what you've got to have is you've got to have a spiritual gymnasium that you go to every day and you are seeking to become more and more and more and more like Jesus. I'm a firm believer in morning time, but I do suggest if your best time is late night, then that's your time. But I do believe every Christian should start with God. The first action of the day tends to rule the day. What you get up doing first tends to stay with you all day long. The psalmist said in Psalm 5 and verse 3, My voice you will hear in the morning. Can you say that to God? Would that be true? God, my voice you will hear in the morning. One of the things that you've got to do is you've got to be a ferocious reader. A ferocious reader of the Word of God. Read it, read it, read it, and read it. And then when you've done that, read it. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, Paul talking to the young man Timothy had this to say. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you that was given to you by, the, uh, by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the, of the presbytery. Here's verse 15. I highlight it if you're prone to write in your Bible. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them. Can you get into it too much? Give yourself entirely to it, he says, that your progress may be evident to all. Stephen Covey talks about a Chinese bamboo tree that when you plant it, you don't see anything for five years. But in the fifth year, it grows about 90 feet. 
You know why? Because in the previous five years, it was putting down a root structure. And the root structure underneath was massive. And in the fifth year, boom, here it comes. And I've seen it happen before in a congregation that here comes a young man or a young lady and you go, whoo, where have they been? Where have they been? They've been putting down a root structure and now they're ready and they come forth and the progress is evident to all. And that's what Paul says. Your, your progress needs to be evident to all. Read all you can. Do you realize that some of the shorter epistles... Second Peter can be read in 10 minutes. Philemon can be read in 2 minutes and 26 seconds. Jude can be read in 3 minutes and 52 seconds. Isaiah 53 can be read in a minute and 56 seconds. Don't tell me you don't have time to read. You sit in a doctor's office, you can knock out a few of them. We have time to read. You read your newspaper, you read your phone. We've got time to read. And the compound effect of reading and reading and reading and reading has a tremendous result on our lives. And you need to scrutinize every single facet of your life. Let me tell you something. There is no part of your life that you can say to God, God, you can have this, but this is off limits. There is no part of our life that is off limits to God that he cannot have. It is full surrender. And we want to, we want to go after every single facet of our lives. James chapter 1. James said it eloquently when he said, verse 21, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word that's able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only. If anyone's a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. How many of you looked into a mirror this morning? I've done it every day this week. I look, I see the problem. <laughs> I, I see the problem. And I try to fix the problem. That's what we are to do with this. We look in it, we see ourselves, we see the mess that we are, and we make the adjustments that we have to make to become more and more like Jesus Christ until the man in the mirror resembles the Lord as he should. You can never say to God, this is off limits to God. Nothing is off limits. Anything, listen to me, anything that is not like Jesus has got to go. And you make no exceptions in your life. You make no allowances in that. And you allow your coach to be hard on you. The greatest athletes in the world want their coaches to be hard on them. They want them to get on them. I don't want to play with it. I am not dilly-dallying around. I want to know what needs to be fixed. Get on me, coach. That's why in Hebrews 12 and verse 11, it says that when we are chastened by God, it's not necessarily pleasant. But in Hebrews 12 and verse 11, it says it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained, trained by it. It's a training I like Psalm 139. You don't have to turn there, I'll tell you. Psalm 139, verse 23, the psalmist says, Lord, search me, try me. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me into life everlasting. God, peg it. You better not ask Jesus what lack I yet. <laughs> He'll tell you. And when he tells you, we must deal with it. Allow your coach to be hard on you and pray, pray, pray. Pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. Back where I live, there was a young man. He was very popular because he just was such a sincere soul. His name was David Hartzell. David got a brain tumor. He had a tremendous sense of humor. I like what he said to the doctor when he first found out he had a brain tumor and they were going to do surgery. The doctor came in and he said, Doctor, he said, will I be able to preach after this surgery? The doctor said, why, sure. He said, good, because I couldn't before. <laughs> after he had, I believe, a second surgery, things began to go downhill for David. A man that worked with him, a young 
trainee, if you will, said he was a tremendously strong prayer warrior. Every day at 7.30, he was locked in his office praying until 8. He prayed on the way to the pulpit. He prayed for me. He taught me so much about communication with God. His sister, who worshipped with us at the congregation where I was, told me that sometimes he would pray and he would get stuck. It's like he was in a loop and he couldn't unlock the loop. And some in those moments, he would, they'd say he'd kind of start doing what they call a little sing-song kind of thing. Like he's, he's just kind of trying to, to sing his way back to, to where he needs to be. But on one day, they said he got really, really stuck. And he couldn't get back to where he wanted to be to continue his prayer. And he paused for a long time with his wife beside him. And he said, God, I'm David. And this is Belinda. And we've loved you for a long time. What a prayer. What a prayer. So simple but so powerful. And I want to say to you that most people are not going to do what I'm talking about this morning. Amen. There will be some of you this morning that will hear what I say, but you will not do it. Amen. And one day you are going to wake up and you are going to be woefully behind because of your sluggishness. Now you can catch up. I've known people that got with it and they did some serious catching up, but you will be woefully behind. In Hebrews, the fifth chapter, beginning in verse 11, the Apostle Paul, if he be the writer of Hebrews, I tend to think so, but he tells them by this time you ought to be teachers. But instead of being a teacher, you need somebody to come along and teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you come to need milk and not solid food. You ought to be with Antoine down at Longhorn eating a steak, but you're sucking a bottle. Amen. And what he says, everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is those who by reason of use, we've used it and we've used it and we've used it, we have our senses exercised to discern between good and evil. Hebrews 6 and verse 11, he simply says to them, do not become sluggish. I'll tell you one thing I don't like. I don't like lazy. I can't stand lazy. I can't tolerate lazy anywhere. Every time I see lazy, I see a slug. And that's why the Bible used the word sluggish. Don't be sluggish. But imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises of God. But I still want to remind you that it's never too late to get after it. I'm not trying to discourage you. Much, pro much progress can still be made. But you need to be setting goals at every stage in your life. I don't care if you're 75 plus right now. You need goals. Amen. And you need uh, desires. And you need things that you're trying to accomplish. Even yet, you might not do what you did in the past. But you can still do much for the Lord. Amen. And then this. Know that Jesus is going to love watching you close the gap and becoming ever closer to him. Here comes the million dollar question. Who do you think that Kobe set before him as the man he was going to chase? Uh-huh. Michael Jordan. Why? He's the standard by which everything else is measured in basketball. And so he chases Jordan. At Kobe's memorial service, Michael had this to say. He said, you know all of us have brothers and sisters who for whatever reason always tend to get in our stuff. Your closet, your shoes, everything. He said, it was a nuisance. But that nuisance turned into love over a period of time just because of the admiration that they had for you as a big brother or a big sister. All the questions, them wanting to know every little detail about the life they are about to embark on. And he says of Kobe, he used to call me at 11.30, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning talking about post-up moves, footwork, and sometimes the triangle. At first it was an aggravation. But then it turned into a certain passion. This kid had a passion like you would never, ever know. He had that kind of passion. And that's what we need to see. And that's what we need to understand. I want you to understand as we sung this morning that I am not talking about Kobe Bryant. This is not about, or Michael Jordan, you know, like Mike. If I could be like Mike. It's not that. That's not our song. 
our song, I'm always amazed at how song leaders do this, and I didn't even tell them what I was doing. Our song is, Oh, to be like thee, Amen. blessed Redeemer. This is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I will forfeit all of earth's treasures, Jesus, thy perfect likeness to wear. As we think about parallels here, though, you need to understand that while Michael may have gotten aggravated at times with Kobe, but really came to love it and appreciate it and cries crocodile tears at his funeral, you will never aggravate Jesus by your desire to know everything about him. He never tires of you calling in prayer. He doesn't care if you rouse during the night and talk to him. In fact, it's gotten to be one of my habits. Sometimes during the night, you ever rouse up just for a second? And sometimes I'll rouse up in the middle of the night and I'll realize I'm awake and I'll just say, I love you, Lord, and go back to sleep. He doesn't tire of that. He loves the scratching. He loves the clawing. He's flattered because it's all about becoming like him. He loves what he sees and he wants to make himself known to you. I'm going to say something. I don't know if you'll agree with me, but I believe that there are some Christians who know Jesus better than other Christians. Amen. There are some Christians who have had things unlocked for them and they experience an intimacy that other people don't know. Amen. A lot of Christians have been inoculated. Amen. You know what it means when you're inoculated? They inoculate you so you will not catch the real thing. And what has happened to so many Christians is they are inoculated and they are yet to catch the real thing. In John 14, beginning in verse 21, Jesus simply said, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And catch this. He says, I will love him and manifest myself to him. That seems to say that the man who loves me, gets after me, wants to be like me, is going to have myself manifested or made known to him in ways that you can't get otherwise. Judas said, not Iscariot, said, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. One of the most iconic pictures in all of basketball is this. Do you know what's happening right there? <laughs> they asked them after the game. Kobe and Michael are at half court during the game. They're playing against each other, and they are bent over at half court. You know what Kobe was doing? Kobe is asking Michael questions. How... Do you feel the defender when your back is turned to him? And remarkably, Michael tells him. <laughs> I feel him with my legs. I'm amazed that here is a guy who has the dare to, in, a, in the middle of a game, to say, teach me. I want to learn from you. And he's so awed by the attitude of this man that he tells him, even when it means he might whip me one day. <laughs> That's remarkable to me. The do's and don'ts, I always tell people, are a means to an end. Don't get aggravated and look at it like, I can't do this, and I can't do this, and I got to do that, and I got to do that. Let me tell you, you know why I do that? Because Jesus would do that. You know why I don't do that? Because Jesus wouldn't do that. And the do's and the don'ts are the means of transformation to become like him. And that's what I want. That's what I want. And that's what I'm pressing upon all of us. And he will not be ashamed to call you little brother. Hebrews says he's not ashamed to call us brethren. And let me add this. Whatever measure you become like Jesus, you need to pass on to others. The Apostle Paul said, again, follow me as I imitate Christ. He says, I'm trying my best to form Christ in you, Christ in you, which is the hope of glory. Can you tell I've been preaching at about 85 miles an hour? <laughs> I did not want to do to you what was suggested I might do to you. We are soon to finish. <laughs> Never waste a failure. Listen to me, please. There are going to be times when you fail. You will mess up. In fact, most of us, all of us really, are just a mess. 
And what you need to do is you need to learn from your failures. Listen to me. There is a sense in which failure does not exist if you learn from it. Failure does not exist if you learn from it. Let me ask you this. If I ask you right now, looking at the life of the Apostle Peter, how he did the whole thing and how he finished, if I ask you, was Peter a failure, what would you say? No. The man was not a failure. Did he fail? Yes. But he learned from it. And he vowed and determined, I don't ever want to see the look on his face again. And he told others, you beware and you resist and you be strong because your adversary the devil goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And Jesus didn't give up on him. I love Mark 16 and verse 7. It says that Jesus said to his disciples, go and after he had risen, go and tell his disciples. And then you get two words. And Peter. Go tell his disciples and make sure you tell Peter that I have risen. You know what? With Jesus, one failure doesn't make a flop. With Jesus, three strikes and you're not out. The Lord continues and it's the progress that he is looking for. Failures and all. Kobe was asked the question, what does losing feel like to you? You know what he said? <laughs> what does losing feel like to you, Kobe? He said, it's exciting. Huh? It's exciting. Here's what he said. It means that you have different ways to get better. There are certain things that you can figure out that you can take advantage of, certain weaknesses that were exposed that you need to sure up. I mean, it hurts to lose, but at the same time, there are answers if you just look at them. If you don't take anything else at home, please take this. When you mess up, don't beat yourself up. It is not good that you failed. But say, I did. Own it. Antoine said, own it. And ask yourself, Kobe said the greatest question that any player can ask is why? Why? If you fail, ask yourself why. Why did it happen? What can I learn? How can I keep it from happening again? Do you realize that failures at all are a means to becoming like him? That's the idea behind all of this. Kobe, in his first year, I think it was, in a very important game, shot four air balls. You know what an air ball is? Air ball, thank you. <laughs> an air ball is when you shoot and the ball doesn't hit anything. No rim, no backboard, no nothing. Here's a professional athlete in the closing moments, counted on to win the game, shoots four four air balls and they said he's, he's, he's all washed up he's not what we thought he would be all kinds of criticism you know what Kobe asked why and here was his answer he figured out that in high school he played about 25 games and he went from high school to the NBA he went from 25 games to playing 82 season games and he realized the problem was my legs the shots were on track. They had exactly the right track, but they fell short. My legs were tired. Question. Once you realize the weakness was my legs, what do you work on? Your legs. There's your template. Whatever it is that's keeping you from being like Jesus, spot it and work on that. And then help your teammates to do the same. 2 Corinthians 2, he talks about one who comes back and he said, don't you swallow him up with too much sorrow, but you reaffirm your love to him. You get behind your comrades that have fallen. You let them know, I've fallen too. Let's get up. Let's get on our feet again. And let's go. Really, there's never a failure. There's always a lesson. I think about the Apostle Peter and we finish right here. Peter ended up with a perfect record. There is no sin on Peter's record. Perfect. Because it's washed in the blood. Peter ended up with a perfect likeness to Jesus, or at least he will. 
Peter will have a perfect body. He will live in a perfect place for all eternity. And that's, going to, that's going to, what's going to happen for every one of us who go to work seeking to close the gap no matter what. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 is where we finish now and the lesson's yours. Paul said, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the power of God may, the power may be of God, not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus all may also may be manifested in our body. Closing the gap, no matter what. May God's grace help us to close the gap on perfection. Let's have a passion. Folks, nothing else matters. Do you understand that this world is going to melt? Do you understand that? Do you understand that if you can set your eyes on it, kiss it goodbye? Anything you see is temporary. There's only one thing in this building this morning that is eternal and you can't see it. You know what it is? Your soul. Somebody said Jesus. That's right, too. The only thing I know of in this building that's eternal among us is my soul. This is it. This is real. This is eternal. And what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? If you need to respond to the gospel this morning, one good sister's already done that. So proud of Bonnie and her commitment. She studied. She labored. She learned. And she applied. Would you come while we stand and as we sing?